The stage is yours. Hello. Um, I'm recording uh, because I'm being recorded. So if you don't want to be on camera, I was told to <laughs> tell you now so that you can leave in case you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> Some of you might be sneaking out of work. It's exciting to speak about this topic, especially to marketing professionals. Uh, there's so much opportunity for us in the next 10 years. And we're going to cover a lot of that information today specifically my own journey, and maybe your, some of your journey, or your friends, or your family. I called this pr presentation the human information system because as our bodies become more and more attached to electronics, it's important to remember what makes us human and what makes us digital. Uh, for me, let me keep going. Uh, as I was walking around uh, the other day, I was taking uh, some video of uh, downtown, um, and all, all the buildings have uh, QR codes, and you can click on it, and then it was in German, but there was a button, and I could click English and then listen to it in English. Um, the other thing I noticed was there was uh, free Wi-Fi in the, in the downtown. So this is probably the most advanced city I've ever been to. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, no one has a mobile phone. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently you've all already gone into the future because I saw no one with a phone. So, uh, but everything is very smart in the city. Um, but you could see my journey from Dublin to here uh, and then my route around the city. It was very, very exciting for me. That picture is a real-time translation from Google Glass. So you can look at anything in any language in German and have it translated to English. So it assists me. The other thing is I use applications from my friends back in uh, the United States to uh, view what I'm viewing in real time. So it's like going into my skin and looking through my eyes. Uh, and that allows not one, but two consumers to have an experience, or three, or four. So remember, you're not dealing with individuals. You're dealing with hypersiduals, one person who represents many. So my story is broken down in a very simple format that was taken from the quantified self. You can find more information about the quantified self movement online. But the process is, what did you do? How did you do it? What did you learn? Now, I added one extra step, because it was Austria and why not? And that's what's next. Um, so to talk ab about what I did, we kind of have to go back in time, so a little time travel. What I did was I became known as the world's most connected human. Now, that's marketing. That's not me. That's what the newspapers say. That's what the radio says. That's what the TV says. I'm just Chris Dancy, and I like information, and I like technology. Um, what I did was in 2003, I noticed that I was sleeping with my BlackBerry on my bed, upside down and away from me, and I would watch the light to see there's a message, and then I quick check my message. And I learned very quickly that I was attached to a lot of digital things. And it didn't matter whether I was sleeping or trying to fall asleep, I was always thinking about that other world all the time. By 2007, it was apparent to me that I was creating a lot of information on the internet, in my home, when I bought something with groceries or a credit card, right? driving my car has a computer. By 2007, everything was connected and, and digital. There's a cartoon called Charlie Brown. Familiar with Charlie Brown? <laughs> <laughs> so this is Pigpen. Do you remember Pigpen? Every place Pigpen goes, he's, there's dirt all around him, right? Every place you go, there's, there's data exhaust. This data exhaust falls off you all the time. And you just don't see it. You don't see the power of it or why it's important. In 2008, I had a photograph taken 
for LinkedIn, <laughs> because that's what you do. You have to look good on LinkedIn. Um, and I also, in 2008, started thinking about my future, because I was turning 40. And <laughs> you do that at 40. <laughs> you go, hmm, 40, OK. So I thought, do I have a skill set that will enable me to be ha have a job when I'm 50? Well, the answer was maybe. But the important question was, was I going to get paid the same amount of money or more? And the answer was no. I was in IT, and IT was changing so fast from 2000 to 2008. The BlackBerry had almost disappeared because people were starting to use smartphones. By 2010, the BlackBerry pretty much had disappeared. Most of our servers in IT were in the cloud. So I decided to change my focus in 2008 and study something I thought would be relevant in the future, and that was personal informatics. I wanted to solve five problems that I faced in 2008. The first one was my doctor, nice guy, very kind to me, but didn't remember anything, and I had a chart that thick. So I would go to see him, and in 2007, I would start writing down on my phone what he told me. By 2009, I was using the internet to find out all the types of cancer I was developing. <laughs> in 2010, I asked for my chart, and I scanned it, and I had it transcribed. And I would go into him and say, well, no, no, in 2003, you said this, and he'd go, ah, and he'd be mad at me. Uh, by 2012, I was using big data, so a service called Flu Near You. So I could say, the flu was one block away. It's coming. It's, it's two houses from me. He'd just hang up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I also started wearing electronics on my body. And uh, so my doctor doesn't talk to me now. <laughs> no more. No. It's very sad. <laughs> uh, uh, the other things I did uh, was uh, the types of electronics I used over the past three years have become more and more sensitive. Uh, everything from EEG headbands uh, to smart clothing uh, to sensors that can tell you what type of composition is in material or food. Uh, I also experimented with genetics uh, using a service called 23Me and microbiomes using a service called Ubiome. And you can learn a lot about yourself. I took that science and then started exploring <coughs> laboratories that would blue blood work on myself so I didn't need to go to the doctor. I could just get blood work. Because I noticed I would only go to the doctor once I was sick. I would never go when I was healthy. So could I learn something when I was healthy about not becoming sick? Does that make sense? Also, I found genetic labs that will do testing to tell you how much DNA is breaking. Second problem, like I said earlier, when you're on your phone or you're on your computer, you're connected to all of these systems, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of systems. So behind me is all the systems I was using all those little pictures. It took a week to took all those screenshots. A week. And I thought, this is information I could use to understand productivity, concentration, health, finances, anything. So I looked for the information patterns in my life, whether it was my behavior, or my dog Rocco, or my house or the devices in my house, or my car, or my mattress. I started putting sensors in everything. And I also noticed when I traveled that the data that was collected was also digital. So literally going from Amsterdam to Hawaii, I had electronic boarding pass that I used at an sec electronic security gate in Belgium that I put my luggage into a, a machine, and the machine took my luggage. It was amazing, because I noticed all of this, the jobs were disappearing. And it was all becoming digital. And how could I enhance my own experience if those systems knew about me? If the luggage machine knew what types of things I packed and could offer me other services? I, I then realized in 2012 that just taking a single photo was, was boring because my friends were tired of my photos. <laughs> what they wanted was information about my day. So I started weaving applications together. 
So the very first time I did it was this one, and I weaved three applications together. So the photo showed what song I was listening to, the weather, and then the picture, which had the location in one photo. Are you familiar with, uh, Facebook just released an application called Hyperlace. If you're not familiar, it's a video application, um, and it takes uh, lots of time and squeezes it together. Have you noticed people want more information in less time? So this is important because people want more information from you. By 2013, I was doing much more elaborate, so I was doing posture, as long as just what I was listening to. And, and this year, I was doing velocity, so traveling on a horse, how fast was I going? What was the temperature? How high was I? Uh, and then all this information was feeding into a system. And my friends love these, because they're like, it's better than a picture, right? They can ask you about different parts of your day. And that's what they want to do. People want to know you. You just have to want to know people. Uh, I then said, if I could do a single photo, why couldn't I do a whole day? So I, I would do these whole day pictures that involved all of this data, from how much money I spent to, to uh, who I talked to, uh, really interesting things. And my friends just started going crazy because they would want to interact with it. And it was like a little time capsule of, of my life that I could look at. The third problem is from the na uh, game Nintendo. When you pulled a cartridge out in the 80s from Nintendo, it said everything not saved will be lost. And all the information that we create, we're losing. It's so valuable. My mother made a book for me as a child of my life. She was very busy. She was uh, not v home very much. And as an adult, I always wondered how hard it was for my mother. When I turned 30, I got a, a box in the mail for Christmas. And it was this gigantic book of all of these things my mother had collected my whole life. She never missed anything. She might have been working, but she was always there. And I was reminded how important it was for us to respect our history and our heritage and what we create. Because we give our lives to these devices, and they give us nothing. Nothing. They don't tell us how beautiful they are. Do you ever notice when your phone's turned off, you can see your reflection? But if you turn your phone on, you're not there. You're gone. Why? So I wanted to make sure that I captured this information, but there's a problem right now in, in digital and media. Our attention is so short that we use services that are purposely ephemeral. And what I mean by ephemeral is they disappear. So everything from a blog to a video to photos to slides, did you notice it's getting shorter? Twitter, 140 characters. Uh, Snapchat, uh, you make a video that just disappears. So the level of ephemerability or temporariness, the temporary nature of what you do online is very important because it's, not, it's gonna get harder to save these things. The fourth problem was it's expensive. Did anybody see the movie Elysium? Elysium is about the rich people who live on this planet while the poor people on, on Earth just fall apart. It's very expensive to have access to your own information. Um, last year, I spent um, 40,000 US dollars to go to these companies and say, I want my information. And they offer it to you like a Fitbit, uh, $99 to get your own information. Can you imagine if Facebook sold you back your own information? <laughs> it's not funny. They probably will. That's the last economic model. Buy your life for this amount. <laughs> Subscribe to your life for only $2 a month, you know. <laughs> it's not that far out there. Uh, and if you've ever tried to find something in Facebook, you know that you would pay for it. Um, the other thing was, while our devices are doing more and more, they're actually getting a lot more, uh, they're just becoming varied and, and more expensive um, and, and how we use these devices and all the information in them. For all intents and purposes, Apple and Google have two devices and they've recreated the internet in both of them. We think we're on the internet, but we're in an Apple and a Google platform. So it's harder to get your information out of these closed systems. Uh, this is a, a, a photo that one of the newspapers did of all the things I have on my body. A lot of people say, what are you wearing? You know, chests and all this other kind of stuff. But you can see these, these toys and gadgets are expensive. And it's important to remember that 
if, if you can benefit from them, do we have a responsibility to make them cheaper or at least give you the information that they create? My home is pretty magical. <laughs> I have uh, sensors all over the house and the whole house communicates with the internet all the time. So if I'm on a, a conference call and I start to talk loud, the lights dim. If I'm not sleeping well, the temperature changes in the house. Mm -hmm. If I'm not sitting up straight in, or I'm sitting in my chair too long, it vibrates and I get up. Right? So in the future, there is no computer screen to use. This is the computer screen. You're in it. This is the computer. Why would you look down or type or touch or talk? You should be able to live with you and just have life happen. That's what computing is for. That's what information is for. Uh, there's videos online if you want to see my house. <laughs> there's lots of people who are interested. I feel like Disneyland or something. Just, Come on in. <laughs> uh, and my dogs have sensors. It was really difficult because sometimes when I was r making all this happen, Rocco would take control of the house. Oof. You don't want a dog. <laughs> Calm down, sit. You know, fix, you know, sit. <laughs> fix, okay, it's fixed. Get it up. It was an easy rule to fix. Anything below three feet has no priority in the house. <laughs> don't bring your children over. They don't count at my home. <laughs> and the types of devices to record our lives were falling into two categories, devices that recorded life and devices that shared what you saw with life. So Google Glass, a camera that takes a picture every few seconds, automatically, very small. And those, those types of things are just very expensive to have. So what did I do? How did I make all this happen? That's, that's you know, kind of the big question. Uh, well, the first thing I did was I wanted to find myself. Remember, I turned 40. When you turn 40, you know, sometimes you'll want to get a fancy sports car or get a new wife or a new husband or a new job. I just wanted to find a new me. Because uh, I thought, I, technology is moving much too fast for me to think that I'm relevant by the time I'm 50. I won't be relevant. So I really focused on three types of information. And as marketers, you might want to think about this when you think about the future. The first is soft data. Soft data is the information that's created when you touch what we would call social media. Now, that also means any type of digital communication. So a text message is soft data. An email is soft data. A Facebook post is soft data. I call it soft data because you can reconstruct your identity. You can answer an email and say, I'm doing great, how are you? And you don't mean it, right? You can put a post up that looks really happy, but you don't mean it. So soft data, you construct identity. Hard data, can you hear that? I can't, I can't fake my heart rate. I can't pretend it's not warm, right? You can't change this. Hard data is sensors or environments that you can measure, right? I can't, fi you know, I can't change the environment. Now, actually, I can at home. <laughs> just by doing this, right? Uh, but we can't do that here. And core data is the medical information, so the information from our blood, from our genetics. Do you understand? So these three types of information worked together to build what you call life. Uh, and some of us live a lot of time in soft data. Some of us live a lot of time in uh, hard data. Ask someone who works outside about, about the weather. They're very familiar with hard data. Ask an office worker, they're very familiar with Facebook. <laughs> Ask someone who's sick, they're very familiar with their blood work. Right? So we're all doing this, we're just not putting them together. For me, I had to then construct a system to gather all of this information. So the first thing that was important was I wanted to live my life and be able to look at you and not take away from us. I wanted us just to be friends. I didn't want to have to write down everything. What did she say? How is she standing? How are you standing? How did you sleep? What did you eat? Where are you? How do you feel? I didn't want to write all that down. 
So I had to look at all the different ways I could get the information and just have a relationship. You would never know that I was collecting all of this, right? Well, you do. <laughs> um, so I took my life and I broke it into 10 areas. Everything from health to uh, entertainment, anything I listen to or watch, read, uh, spirituality, meditate, pray, uh, finances. Anything I do, was there a way to get that behavior and save it? I then tied it to Maslow's hierarchy of needs because I needed to understand, is this more important than this? Hmm. So if I'm spending a lot of time shopping, I probably have to have a job first, right? So am I performing at my job in a way that's effective? And then I mapped everything, so it came to a system in the, in the cloud, and it automatically wrote to a central repository. Now, if you were creating a system that would save all of your information in order as it happened, what would you, what would you map it to? Anybody want to guess? What application could you use on all of your phones? It's on your phone right now. What application would you put all of your information in moment by moment as it happens? A calendar. So all of my information goes into to a cloud calendar in real time. This allows me to search it, color code it, right? Uh, and do elaborate things with it. I then take it from the calendar and it goes into text documents so I can do deep analysis. It also automatically writes to spreadsheets and automatically I can upload it to Stanford's deep learning engine. So my whole life is chronicled in real time right now in a calendar. Play a song, it'll happen. I'll listen to it and get it. Right? And what's amazing about this is you can start to understand a lot of things about yourself that you have no idea. I won't go into some of them, but I'll go into a few, because some of them are kind of scary. <laughs> there are things you don't want to know about yourself, trust me. I'll tell you one. I'll tell you one something today. You're a big habit. <laughs> Everything, you, you're the same thing over and over again. You don't realize it. But no matter how much you think you're changing, you're just repeating the same stuff with different people. OK, that's not in the deck. I went real faster. Um, so the first thing I learned, when the only value is uh, left is time, the world becomes a clock. Hmm. So if you notice, you're always busy. There's never free time. You can't keep up. Everything, you can't watch TV shows anymore. You can't stay on top of them. You have to binge watch television. You have to read the internet as fast as you can. You'll read an article and see how long the article is and just change So I'm not going to read that. You'll look at the date on a web page and go, too old, right? Time is everything. So for me, a single day has thousands of pieces of, of data elements that are worth so much money. My insurance company for my home will give me a discount if I use their cameras and their sensors. My car insurance company will give me a discount if I use their sensor. Right? My health insurance will give me a discount if I use their sensor. They won't give me the information, but they'll give me money. Everything you touch is worth money. Money on the floor. You know this as marketers. You're focusing on attention. I'm telling you, you should focus on something different, maybe. The second thing I learned was I have a data doppelganger. And doppelganger is like a duplicate. Right? And I learned that even though I could be physically in a spot, there was a data footprint of that spot. So for example, you can go to St. Peter's Basilica and stand there, and your phone will tell you exactly that you're there. But it's much different when you walk St. Peter's Basilica, and your fitness device knows how high and how many steps you took, and says, you're at St. Peter's Basilica. Do you understand? The biological Activity knows where you are and what you're doing, not the location. I call this concept the inner net, right? Because the internet doesn't make sense. Why? No one goes there. <laughs> they build apps, and no one's going to apps. So what are you going to do? By the way, I'm the answer. I'm kind of cocky that way. Second, th second thing, people love information. I haven't been any place in two years where the news just doesn't go crazy. Now, unfortunately, there's a big tech event in Berlin. <laughs> uh, 
um, or else the news would be here because people want to talk about my story because it's such a profound change in the way we live our lives and the way that we engage with people. The next thing I learned, the first thing was data, this one's on information, is that birds that were born in a cage think that flying is sick, <laughs> right? They don't know. They, I'm in a cage. If you fly, that's wrong. It's crazy. You're in a cage. Hmm. So I wasn't aware that my environment at home was toxic, but a very small sensor next to my bed showed me very quickly when I wake up at night, just a little bit, it's probably some light or a noise or air quality or air pressure. Little teeny things in your environment change you in subtle ways you're just unaware of. And the sensors that you can put in your home today, most of them are built into the devices we have, smoke detectors and other things like that. But we don't have access to the data, do we? But if you did, you would learn very quickly you can sleep more deeply and more soundly and more restfully just by watching the environment. For me, something as simple as the CO2 levels in my house affected how I drove. So I made sure I stood out, when I walked outside of my house to my car, I took a couple deep breaths and relaxed for a moment because the house can be really toxic. The neat thing about this is uh, uh, Android phones will measure this too. So when you go to work um, on uh, next week or, or tomorrow, depending on when you go to work, and you go to your desk, get, get an app that measures the air quality and get a sensor and tell your boss, this place is sick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never coming back. Because <laughs> you know? it probably is. It's normal. And that's why sometimes you have headaches and you just don't feel well at work. Uh, I also, it's also the people you work with, but I won't go there. <laughs> um, also, uh, microbiomes and medical information is very, very powerful. I encourage you all to really get involved in your own health while you're healthy. Probably the most important thing I did was the thing everyone likes to talk about was I lost 120 pounds. So two years ago, I was much bigger, <laughs> a lot bigger. Um, and I didn't know it. You know, I'd gotten to 40, and I was very big. Uh, and I was smoking lots of cigarettes and drinking lots of alcohol. But between 40 and 43, I captured as much data as I could. And then when I was 43, I said, now is time. And I looked at all the information in my calendar, and I said, is there a difference between a day with 4,000 calories and a day with 3,500 calories? Just one, 500 calories, that's all I wanted. I pulled that information up, and I said, is there anything consistent in these days about that 500 calories that I'm missing? People, music, work, travel, money. Is there anything consistent? I found the consistent things in my life that were different when I ate less and said, now, these things, can I make the world more like them? So blocking people from phoning me, blocking people from emailing me, changing the music automatically if it's going to affect how I eat, eating in places that aren't too bright or too loud, right? So the information literally guided me like a GPS. A GPS, you say, I want to go to um, uh, District 1 uh, in Vienna. And GPS goes, doo -doo 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 -doo. but now you can say, I want to lose 100 pounds. I want to learn German. I want to be a better lover. I want to be more focused. And life can just happen for you. Does that make sense? All the information is there. It's just hidden from you. Why? Knowledge. Data, information, knowledge. So people are not machines, but in every situation where they're given a choice, they'll behave like a machine. <laughs> they do. You mimic the machines that are around you. The level of mimicry or copycatting on a machine is directly proportional to how consistent it is. In the United States, I don't know about Austria, but people will wait in line in a queue for a, a, a grocery machine or an ATM, but there could be someone, a human, standing there open, and no one will talk to the human. Have you, noticed, have you ever seen this? It's crazy. You wait in line for the machine. And it's because I believe machines, while they're not amazing, they're consistently average, right? They're just average, but they're consistently average. Sometimes they're consistently bad. And as humans, 
because we, we're used to dealing with electronics, we'll take consistently bad over occasionally amazing, right? If you talk to someone at a, at a store, you don't know how they're going to behave, right? It's like the lotto, oh, you know, <laughs> right? So machines are very powerful that way. The other thing is you become your phone. So this is someone who tweeted that the machine at the gas station was broken and she had to use the clerk like a poor person. So she equates using a machine with being rich and talking to a human with being poor. And if you notice, our, our, our devices control us. Have you ever taken a panoramic photo? You're just dancing with your phone. Your phone's making you dance. Have you ever not been able to get a signal and you do Lion King? <laughs> the phone is controlling you. At the grocery store when you're scanning groceries and you're trying to get that laser just right, right? You won't admit it, but you do. You watch that laser, right? If you're bending and contorting your body to a machine, the machine is in control. If you're bending your body in front of a machine, the machine is in control. We don't have bad technology. We have poorly designed machines. The last one, last thing I learned was about wisdom. And that's the mind, unaided without any help, is highly overrated. Um, the real power comes from extending our mind. So if you go back 100,000 years to someone who picked up a rock and killed a bear, right? He extended himself. She extended herself. If you went back mm, 2,000 years to Austria and you handed someone a rain jacket, they would think you were a god. The jacket, the technology, extended yourself. If you use a phone today or a computer, you extend yourself. I call this concept perspective as a service because truly brilliant people that I meet have perspective. They think about their lives and they think about time. Many applications today have this in them, but we really haven't hit a critical moment yet for software, for marketing, for science where we understand how it should work. But I'll give you a clue. There are some applications on your phone that return value to you. Do you remember earlier when I said when your phone's turned off, you can see your reflection, but if you turn your phone on, you can't? If you were in an application that showed you information about you, you would want to use it. If you, were, if you went to a grocery store and the receipt showed you the calories of everything you bought, and how often you bought it, you would always go to that grocery store. We're hungry to know about ourselves, and we have the information to create these relationships, but we choose not to. We choose to create applications and systems and services where we give and give and give. We don't choose to return anything. Something I love is a system called O-Life. It's just email. And every night I get an email, and it says, 322 days ago, and then it'll be something I typed. Like today, it was 81 days ago. It's just random. Sometimes it's like 1,731 days ago, right? And it'll have something I wrote. But every night or in the middle of the day, I never know when it's gonna come. It's like a secret from the past. It comes to my inbox and I read it and I remember, oh look, life is amazing. Look how much has changed, right? I'm sure some of you are on Facebook. At the end of last year, Facebook did a project called Look Back, and they allowed everyone to create a video of their, that year on Facebook. Facebook gave you 30 seconds of your life, and you gave them a year. So we need to create and think about how, if someone's going to use our applications or our services or read our advertisements or, or understand our messaging, how do we create minimum viable human? How do we leave enough room in our messaging so that someone can imprint and see themselves back out of that? It's very critical right now because if you don't master this, you won't have a job in 10 years because people will only deal with things that show them who they are.
we're getting to the point with privacy and technology where people are fed up. So what are some of the implications, the future? Right? This was all the past, by the way. Everything I talked about was in the past. I'm from the past, and I'm not alone. Right? So what does it look like in 2020? Well, think about this for a moment. <laughs> Six years ago, or well, let's five years ago, most people didn't have smartphones. In five years, it'll be 2020. Most people will have already gone through Google Glass and be using something else, a contact lens. And it'll be collecting biological information. So what, I mean, just five years from now, which will go very quick, how many of you are over 30? Are you over 30 years old? Some of you, most of you? Five years is very fast. <laughs> it's literally a week. <laughs> For those of you under 25, trust me, you'll understand soon. <laughs> so how do we get our heads around the next five years? For me, it was about understanding that we're looking at a shift. We're looking at a brand new economy. And in this new economy, people behave and things behave differently. Remember, in 2003, in the early 2000s, we became really interested in using connected technology. In 2007, we were creating a lot of information. By 2009, we were building applications as fast as we could, right? SMAC, Social Mobile Analytical Cloud. But that's not working anymore. <laughs> There's so many apps, right? Why? It's not working anymore. And it's gone from a phone that takes pictures to a camera that makes calls. <laughs> Sit with that. Uh, next Tuesday, when Apple makes their announcement, they're going to release um, Health Kit and Home Kit, and Google releases Google Fit and Nest Connect. Within a month, all of your consumers and all of your phones will be running biological systems watching you a month from now. So five years from now, it'll be commonplace to talk about biology as it relates to your job, right? When, when Apple announced they were putting the fingerprint sensor in the phone, Everyone went crazy, ah, privacy, ah, fingerprint, ah. Two months later, if you couldn't buy something with your fingerprint, you lost your mind, right? <laughs> so the event horizon between your privacy and your convenience is about two weeks. <laughs> right? And that's the past. That's the past. This is important. This is the latest uh, Android phone from Samsung. It basically has more sensors than anything else. Air, light. It's amazing how many sensors are in these phones. Next week, Apple might announce a wristband that has a sensor built into it. They've got an API called HealthKit for it. Why wouldn't they? What could you do or what, what will you learn when consumers say, not a bad review. I hated the service here. It's terrible. And you put that on the internet. And we read hateful comments all day long. What happens when a consumer says, here's my heart rate. Here's how bad you made me feel. And they show you their body. Right? You will. That's the first thing you will weaponize. I hate this place. Look how bad. Look at the temperature in this hotel room. <laughs> you will. Don't, don't laugh. You will. So, you know, what do we do to get around that? So... Interestingly enough, uh, there was an earthquake in California last month, and Jawbone released this graph. And basically, they took everybody wearing a Jawbone and showed them waking up during the earthquake and then going back to sleep. And every news outlet in, a, in the United States covered this. They covered the earthquake for maybe five minutes, covered everybody waking up for a day. <laughs> right? So the body itself is a platform for compute. And this is the past. What I think we're going to see is wellness, healthy, happy, well-being, a sense of purpose as the platform next year. I think if you're smart, that's where you focus. How do you return healthy information about behavior to a consumer, to a customer, to your family, to yourself, to yourself? If you're a young person who's studying uh, and, and moving to Hong Kong to be um, a music teacher and help them sing like the Vienna Boys Choir. What could you do to help those children learn about themselves? 
What type of confidence could you bestow upon them by sharing beautiful information about them? Right? They all have mobile phones. Could, you, could they learn something from their voice, voice, voice? Right? I'm not a singer, and I actually told my friend here that I'm embarrassed to sing, but I loved my music teacher growing up. She made me believe in myself. If we go out just a little bit further out, we hit what I call existence as a platform. I did these slides in 2010, uh, and I've had many companies ask me for the methodology behind it, but, but like I said, design for a world where you work where there are no computer screens. If you're not thinking about how your job can be done without a computer screen, you probably won't have a job in 15 years because this is the computer screen, this is the computer screen, this is the computer screen, this is the computer screen. This is the computer screen. This is the computer screen. Right? By 2020, there will be, won't be an app store like we know. You'll download habits. You'll download environments. Google and Apple both have home and body in the new phones. In five years, those homes and those bodies applications will be together, and people will create environments and habits. It's happening now. I believe by 2030, we won't be talking about the internet of things, but the personification of things. Why doesn't this microphone know it's me? Why doesn't the chair know it's me? Why doesn't the bottle tell me how I did with, that this is my fifth bottle of water? I can stop, right? We'll be so angry. I'll be working in 2030, right? How will I work in a world that's constantly feeling like it knows me? And where will I go if I don't want to be known? And when everything I touch knows me? I think by 2040, hopefully I'll be able to retire by then. I doubt it. We'll be using a lot more genetic information. So it's not too soon for those of you who are a little bit younger to start reading about genetics and genetic manipulation and how it can help ourselves. Ultimately, what I'd like you to leave for you to think about is as a species, we've created the most powerful device ever devised. It wasn't fire. Fire killed people, right? It also helped things. But these devices that we've created now contain who we are and who we believe ourselves to be. Even if you don't have a smartphone and never plan on owning one, most of the people in your life will. How do you deal with people who aren't individuals but are hypersigils? They're both here and there. And in both places, they want to be heard by everyone constantly. I believe the only way to do that is to take time each and every moment to look at the people, the devices, the applications, the sensors that you're using and saying, are they telling me about me? Could your single greatest purpose in life is to be kind to yourself. And we've never had more of an opportunity to do that than today. Dankeschön.